Welcome to Generation, Bible, Generation Impact Bible College tonight. Um, so awesome to have you guys with us. And we're looking forward to an awesome time in this session as we worship and uh, learn from the Lord. And uh, just take His Word and break His Word down and allow His Word to become part of us and who we are. And uh, to saturate the Word. So we're trusting God tonight that there's, the Word will go forth in power and in might. Uh, it will not return void, but it will accomplish absolutely everything it sent out to do. So we're trusting God for a mighty touch of His Spirit in Jesus' name. As people are busy coming on, uh, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank You this evening, Lord, for Your Word that is in us, can work through us, Father God. And Lord, we thank You for even as You come by Your Spirit and reveal Yourself and make Yourself real to us, Father God, through your word, I pray for those that are watching and listening, Lord, that their hearts will be prepared, that we fit our ground, that they will receive the word that comes, Father God, and be able to use it, Lord. And as they perceive themselves in it as a mirror, Father God, they will not walk away and forget from what they saw. But, Father God, they will embrace it and allow it to saturate and come into their lives and change them and make them into the men and women that you want them to be. So, Father God, I thank you tonight will not just be an opportunity to gather information, but, Father God, it will be an opportunity to grow in the things of the Spirit and to get to know you better and to know who you are and to hear your heartbeat and to come close, Father. So, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise in advance for what you are busy doing in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Great time. Thank you for those that are joining on at the moment. You have come into Generation Impact Bible College. And uh, we are doing topic number 217 tonight. Yo, can you believe it? We're already in the 200s. Going on, uh, going on strong. And uh, by the way, if you have not joined uh, Father's um, Generation Impact Bible College, and you are, have any inclination to want to join and to get some kind of qualification or award afterwards, please go to the GIBC website and uh, join and become a student. And uh, we will be very happy to, to go through the process with you and help you to become more proficient in the things of the Lord. Amen. So tonight the topic title is Christianity versus the Kingdom. Christianity versus the kingdom. And we're going to be doing this in two parts as well. We're going to be doing a part one, part two. And uh, tonight we're going to be covering the first part of this particular topic. Now, it's a very interesting uh, uh, discussion because uh, not too long ago we actually had, we did the same kind of discussion, but we call it Christianity versus discipleship or Christianity versus following Christ. So, we, yeah, and tonight's one, the topic is very much the same, and we're going to cover very much the same material, but it is covering um, what is the difference between this thing called Christianity and uh, this thing called the kingdom or disciple. And the big difference being, and just to set the context and the stage for you before we go into the material for tonight, is that many people call themselves Christians. Okay, they all over the place, uh, many denominations, many groupings, uh, many networks call themselves Christians, but there's a lot of uh, variations and differences between them. So you will find that like we, we, we will be most probably classified as uh, charismatic slash evangelical type grouping, Pentecostal type grouping. And then you'll get the mainline churches, you'll get the, the uh, Roman Catholics, you get all these people that call themselves Christians, but um, it's a, there's different um, values and standards and most probably interpretation of scripture between them. Uh, in, in our nation, in the nation of South Africa, you'll find that uh, most probably, I think this last statistics I saw and read, uh, they claimed that something like 84% or whatever of the nation was Christian, but there were so many groupings that, was, that, were, that were titled or named Christian, but not necessarily all of them are practicing Christians as we know they are, or what we believe rather. So tonight, then, the whole purpose of this particular topic is to go through and to be able to get a clearer understanding of what we understand as being the kingdom or being a true follower of Christ or being a disciple of Christ versus just carrying the label or the name of Christian. All right. So we're going to go through that and we're going to cover various um, points in this particular topic. And hopefully by the time we have done that, we will have a clearer understanding of what we mean when we talk about a true follower of Christ, somebody who is a disciple of Christ, and somebody who's got a heart for God 
and believes in establishing his kingdom here on this earth today. So in other words, believers that are activated and on fire for God and doing the work of the, of, of the ministry. All right, so the first point then we have a look at is under Christianity, we look at the concept of salvation. Salvation is offered through altar calls, um, it heads, heads bowed so no one sees, soft music to soothe the soul, and repeat after me prayers. In other words, you'll find it's a form. Okay, it's a form where people think that merely because they have come and the, the atmosphere has been created and, and all that kind of stuff has been done, so now they, 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 they try and make it as easy as possible. Don't let people will see them. Close your eyes. Um, and very often there's, there's a soft music, create an atmosphere. And through that then they pray. But in the true follower of Christ, the Bible does not describe it like that. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, it says, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In other words, salvation is by the power of God, which convicts the, throw, through, throw, sorry, convicts the soul through preaching of the word, and people ask, what must I do to get saved? So we need to make sure that when we are, are portraying the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our lives testify of who He is, so that when people look and see, they can see that there's something different about you and I, and they want what we have, all right? And therefore the question then comes up, what must I do to be born again or to be saved? So, that is the biggest difference between the two. Don't just create a form, all right? And don't just create a, a, a situation where, where people can, out of a, um, a, a conviction, just come into a place of not making a quali qualified or a quality decision. We want them to come to a place where they, they know what the price is, they understand that it's a life-changing decision they make. And when they make that decision, something they're not going to back off from. It's not something they're going to weaken on, but it's something they're going to press in and they're going to make sure it's there for the rest of their life. Now, that is the first point that we want to highlight and show, is that there's a difference in just creating an atmosphere, getting somebody just to acknowledge Christ, but not making a life-changing decision. All right. The next point is evangelism is a quest to see how many people... Okay, so in, in Christianity then, what they do is they push through and they want to evangelize and get a quest and they just want to get people to pray a salvation prayer, all right? Or just pray a, a prayer so they can have numbers and it's all about the quantity, it's all about the numbers. In today's world and in the kingdom of God and the true follower of Christ, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22... To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Evangelism, evangelism is preaching the good news and making disciples. It's not all about quantity, it's also about quality. Alright, so in other words, the Bible tells me in the Great Commission that not only must I preach the gospel, not only must I go out and pronounce the good news of Jesus Christ, at the same time, I need to disciple people. I need to mentor them. I need to grow them. I need to develop them so they can become true followers of Christ and be grafted into the kingdom of God and develop to become strong believers. And then they will also evangelize and bring people into the kingdom of God. Obviously, we understand that there is place for mass evangelism. We understand that. We don't have any problem with that. And we understand that there are times when we will have huge crowds, and we, God will use that to bring people in. But God will also make sure that there is a way that those people can be brought into the kingdom of God, and then the discipleship will take place thereafter. So we have to put our faith out there that it's not just an exercise of, of evangelizing people and bringing them into the kingdom, but it's also making sure that those that do come to know the king, uh, come to know Jesus, are actually brought into the kingdom of God, and we nurture grow, disciple, and develop them into becoming most powerful followers of Christ. Then we see in the Christianity, faith just means believing. All right, point number three. So the faith is just believing. A Christian is supposed to be anyone who believes in God. All right, biblical faith on the kingdom and the disciple of Christ is an action manifested through obedience. A Christian is one who actively demonstrates his or her faith in Jesus 
by obeying His commands. All right, both scriptural and also small, still voice, and whichever other way you believe God is speaking. That is a disciple. Only born again disciples are true uh, Christians. So, in other words, you and I show that we are disciples by bearing forth much fruit in our lives, according to John fifteen eight, and it tells. And then we follow Christ, and the Father is glorified by us following the command, the instruction. In other words, you're becoming doers of the word of God, not hearers only, the way James puts it. So we take the word of God and we bring it into our lives and we live a life where we change and become more like Christ every single day. So it is not merely making a statement to say, I believe Jesus, um, I believe in Jesus, I believe Jesus is there, Jesus and whatever. And But it's believing that Jesus is the Son of God and acting upon that faith and becoming a doer of the word and not only a euro. Then the next point is the church in Christianity is normally a building with services to attend once or twice a week. So in other words, the people love their church. They love going to a building. They love everything that happens in that building. And for them, it's all about the, the, the various events that take place in that building, whether it be on Sunday, whether it be on a, a Wednesday. But once they leave that building, they live whichever way they want to. All right. So their faith and their lifestyle does not necessarily link up and it doesn't show forth. Now, as a true disciple of God, the church consists of disciples who are in fellowship with the Lord all week long. All right. And is made up of lively stones. Now we see that in First Peter chapter two and verse five. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we, the, so people that are true followers of Christ, true, true disciples of Jesus, sees the body, sees the church as being the body of Christ, the the coming together of all the people that follow Christ. So the church is the believer rather than the church being an event held, held in a building. The difference between Christianity and a true disciple. Then the next point is a person in Christianity joins the church through water baptism and membership classes. In other words, there's a process involved. They go through the various steps and then they become a member of the church. So it looks like they're joining some kind of organization and or club which is different to what the Bible describes it. In the case of, a, of, of, of Scripture, a person joins the body of Christ through faith in Christ and repentance. Okay, And then you identify as the next process with Christ by going through the waters of baptism explained in Romans chapter 6. So therefore we identify with Christ and we go through the waters of baptism. So, it is no, you don't go through a class, you don't run some kind of assessment or test. Um, there's none of that. It is all faith. The minute that you and I accept Christ into our hearts and lives, we become a disciple of Christ. And then we live out our life in that. All right. So we start studying the word of God. We start studying scripture. We start learning about God. And then we start pushing through into all of those things. Okay. Then the next one, fellowship in, in Christianity, then first fellowship is based on friendship and it's chosen according to likes, dislikes and common interests. <coughs> so therefore relationships are built on friendship, all right, and getting to know people. Now obviously there's friendships involved, but in the body of Christ as a disciple, fellowship is defined by unity in the spirit. All right? In other words, we all follow Christ. We are one because of our faith in Him. Therefore, we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And unity is established on that. And based on that faith in God and the blood of Jesus, we are united into one family, one big family. And therefore, our fellowship, we fellowship one with another, and we build our faith and our confidence through that. It is God, we, we, in actual fact, you, we cannot really choose, <laughs> you know, who we want to be friends with and who we can't. We have to love everybody and we do love everybody because why? We see Christ in them and we follow the faith that we have and united by our faith. All right. So then we see that in Christianity, 
Churches are made up of attendees, okay, who are either too busy or too intimidated to get directly involved in meeting others' needs. All right, now, in Acts chapter 2, we see the picture in verse 44 uh, through to 47. We see, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold possessions and goods and divided them among all and anyone who had, and as anyone had need, sorry. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord um, added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we see then in the body of Christ, we see then under the kingdom or the discipleship basis that the early church experienced what church should be. They shared all their common things and distributed their goods to all men as every man had need. They broke bread together from house to house. Whenever they met, they praised God in singleness of heart. So in other words, I think in the modern world, we we've, we've tend to create very big gatherings, very big churches um, in numbers. All right? and, and that has pros and cons in itself. We understand and know that, that um, in the New Testament church, especially in the book of Acts, although many got added to the church very, very quickly, um, we understand that they were gathering together in homes, in smaller groups, and by doing that, they were also caring and looking after one another. So today, in today's world, we need to understand also, and I think very much what we experienced the last two years with the pandemic and everything else, that um, a much more effective way of reaching the people and to be able to meet the needs of the people is in the context of a smaller group, all right? A bigger group can be shut down and limited by government and by any other things that are going on, especially if your constitution allows it. So therefore, you have limitations and problems. So there's a definite place for the smaller groups and the way that it operates and works. So so we can learn from that, but the, the crux and the, the message here is that the problem is that in Christianity, the church becomes just a place where people attend, all right? And uh, where they attend, they still tend to be too busy to really become uh, intimately involved, really get to know one another, get to know the needs of one another, be able to care for one another. So there are limitations. Whereas in the smaller group context and environment, as in the early church, we have the responsibility to look after one another and help one another wherever we can and to be generous in our giving, generous in our heart and try wherever possible to, to meet the needs of others around about us, if so directed. Then we also see in Christianity that church leaders do not know individual members very well. Now that's pretty obvious because very often that what happens, you've got a huge church, say 500, no, say 1,000 plus people, and uh, you find the leaders don't, re because there's so many people, they don't really get to touch one another properly. And the leaders, especially the senior ones, um, do not know everybody. Whereas the, the elders and the people in the church should know their flock as well as possible. All right, And that responsibility is sometimes moved on to the smaller group leaders. And that's not a bad thing, All right, as long as the people connect and build relationships. So... The bottom line is that we need to know and care for those that God has put under our care. That is the message we're trying to, to communicate. Then in the church, we've got biblical truths. Or cust sorry, in Christianity, we see biblical truths are customized to one's lifestyle as is convenient. Change is optional. So therefore, in the, in, in the discipleship and in the kingdom, Biblical truths are the very core of one's lifestyle. Change is necessary to line up with the word. So there's a there's a difference in attitude, okay, to the things of the Bible. So in other words, in, a true disciple will take the Bible, apply it to his life, and he will live out that truth. So in other words, if the, whatever the Bible instructs him, that's what he does, all right, or that's what she does. Whereas in Christianity. They tend to want to customize the Bible. They tend to want to make it fit your environment and your situation. I've heard many people in recent years say that the Bible in certain places is no longer relevant. It's, on, it's lost contact with people and where they live and how are because it was written so long ago. 
But I've got news for you. The Bible is as relevant today as it ever has been and ever will be. All right. So scripture applies today, even as applied 2000 years, 4000 years, whatever. Doesn't matter. It is still as relevant today as it ever has been. And we can take that scripture and we can live. And it is the rock. It's the foundation upon which we base our lives. So therefore, today we need to understand that the Bible becomes the core of what we believe. So for believers today, the Bible is what we live according to, and that is what we demonstrate in our daily lives. It's the biblical truth. We cannot change the Bible. We cannot adjust the Bible to suit us. We change to what the Bible instructs us to be. All right? It's not the other way around. Then in Christianity, our moral decisions are based on choosing good or evil. All right? Based on the world's perspective of what's good and evil. Those are morally good can earn eternal life. So many people think by living a good life, especially in Christianity, if you live a good life, you can still get into heaven. They believe that there are many ways to get to heaven. All right. And uh, all paths lead to heaven. I've even heard some people say. So the Christianity has weakened the fact that moral decisions are based on choosing life. Or death, all right? That's according to Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. So only those who are in Christ will inherit the gift of eternal life. Okay, so that's very clear according to Romans 6, 23 as well. So we understand that the only way to heaven, there is only one true God. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And it's not by moral decisions. It's not by what you feel good about or what you think is good or what you think is evil, has got nothing to do with what you and I think, it is what the Bible says is good, and what the Bible says is not good, alright? Then in Christianity also, a person learns about God through an endless stream of books, tapes, and sermons. So what people do is they tend to gather information, alright? So they go through, and they're just gaining, gaining knowledge, they're gaining information, and that is what Christianity tends to do. It becomes becomes an academic exercise, all right? Whereas in, as a disciple, a person learns about God through personal study of His Word and by the teaching of the Holy Ghost. Now, I would like to add this on top of that, and that is to become intimately involved with Him, developing a relationship with God and experiencing God for yourself as you learn about Him. God is not a dead God. God lives, His Holy Spirit is with us, and he wants to relate with you and I in a real intimate way. So we need to know and understand that it's not just learning and getting information. It is developing a relationship with the Father, the rep- developing a relationship with him through the Holy Ghost, and growing our relationship and intimacy with him so we become more like him. Then we also see in Christianity, pastors preach motivational speeches, okay? Eloquent sermons, masters of, of, the, of the language that they're ministering in, and every wind of doctrine. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now we also know that Paul also says that he doesn't preach from a place of eloquent words and trying to impress people with fancy language. He comes in the power of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So we see in 1, Corinth, sorry, in, uh, 1 Peter 4 verse 11, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. So we speak what we feel God inspires us. All right. To speak. Too many pastors research their sermons nowadays through uh, things like um, Google. You know, they'll actually even buy sermons off the internet because you can. And they'll take that and they'll try and then adjust that to, to, to be whatever or relevant in whatever situation might be happening at the moment. So they are preaching, one pastor is preaching another pastor's revelation, and they don't really even have the revelation. They're just preaching information. So we've got to be very careful um, when we minister the Word of God that we don't do it from a place 
of compromise. But we do it as uh, directed by the Lord through His Holy Spirit. So that means that the pastors in the uh, true disciple, the true follower of Christ, will take the time to seek God's face and find out what the Lord wants to say at that particular time to that particular group of people. And once they've found the unction or the inspiration of what they feel God is saying that they need to communicate, they will then bring that message in power and be able to deliver that to their audience so the audience can grow and develop and the Spirit of God can bring life into that situation. So it doesn't become a dead word, but it becomes a life-giving revelation of what God wants to communicate at that particular moment of time. Then we see also in Christianity, as I mentioned right in the beginning, that there are so many denominations out there, so many groups of people, varieties of people, and varieties of beliefs that call themselves Christians, okay? And they don't, they're not really, they're not really Christians. Because the thing is that they have just got a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Okay, God's way says, and the true disciple of God says that there is one way, one truth, one life, one narrow gate to heaven, and that is Jesus himself. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we do know that. We do understand that. There is only one way to, to heaven. There is only one way to God. And that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. And we preach Him and Him only and nobody else. Then we also see that churches lure big crowds through entertaining programs. I think that in our modern era has become so, so relevant or so real, is that churches are trying to become uh, entertainment centers. So what's happening is that they have programs, they have exciting media, uh, big name speakers, and they use all that. Now I've got no problem, again, with using certain things on people to attract people into churches. No problem. But when that becomes the only thing that you do and absolutely nothing else, and it becomes an entertainment and a show, that I've got a problem with because then you, you're taking the life right out of it. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. In other words, we need to see the hand of God move. We need to see the power of God. It is not about you know, having the latest technology with all that kind of stuff. Yes, we use it, and yes, it's, it's to our benefit, and yes, we can maximize that, but it's not about that. Amen? So in the, in the case then of true believers and those that are trying to build the kingdom of God, it is the light of Christ. It's Christ himself. He says, lift me up. And I will draw all men unto me. So we lift up Christ. And we lift up who he is. And he will draw all men unto himself. We also understand though that we cannot save anybody. Alright. The, the, the Bible teaches us in John chapter 6. That people can only come to know Christ. If the Father draws them. Alright. So we understand that. And know that it's, it's him and him only. Okay. Matthew eighteen twenty it says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. I am there in the midst of them. So we understand that we need to lift up Christ <coughs> and Jesus only, and He will draw all men unto Himself. Amen. And then we see in Christianity, worship serve as the high energy, it's, it's, it's flashy, it's also fleshly, and it's also emotionally driven and soulish, okay, in, many, in, in some instances. Okay. We need to worship God in spirit and truth. So true disciples are going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we need to allow that manifestation of the Spirit of God during worship in our services. The, at the end of the day, all right, it does not mean that we don't use instruments, technology, everything else that's available. Because those things have been created. God's given us the inspiration. And we can have the best music. We can have the best of everything. And still, in that environment, we can lift up God and worship Him for who he is. All right. We worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. Then in the, in Christianity, then you see many of the, the churches will worship, worship is with the lips, but
but the heart is far from God. So in other words, they're singing songs. So all they're doing is they're just saying, okay, fine, we're going to have three or four or five songs. They'll go through it, nice songs, nice music, good voices, um, professionals in what they're doing. So it's a very nice environment, very nice atmosphere. And uh, so they just, but at the end of the day, they're just singing songs. True worship of a disciple and one who is establishing the kingdom of God is a lifestyle. Okay, it's pleasing unto God. It's praising Him with a pure heart. It's seeking His face. It's wanting to touch Him and allowing Him to inhabit our praises and to enthrone Him with our praises. So it's an outflow of our relationship with Him, trusting Him and believing Him in our lives. Okay. Then we have in Christianity, beliefs are based on religious traditions and doctrines of men. We see that in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the doc commandments of men. So in other words, they, they bring in man's wisdom. They bring in what man thinks. They bring in, man tries to be clever in other words. And they bring that in. But we understand and know that our beliefs as a true believer, as a true disciple, as a true follower of Christ, in the kingdom of God is based on Scripture and what the Word of God teaches. And that is our final authority. Nothing more, nothing less. Then the last point is, in Christianity, confidence is placed in human ingenuity. All right? Man's ideas and methods, in other words, to build the church. So, man tries to build the church. In, in, in true kingdom teaching and discipleship, Confidence is placed, obviously, on Christ and Him crucified. And He made it clear that He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, So, we allow Christ to build the church. We are but stewards of that which is placed in our hands. We are His hands, His eyes, whatever, to allow Him to work through us to establish His kingdom here on earth. All right? So we are instruments in hands and we follow as his disciples. So, so that gives you some ideas, all right, and, and it's really just to make you aware of the fact that there is a false Christianity or form of godliness, let me put it that way, that is out there. There are many believers who quote to be followers of Christ, but if you look at their lifestyle and you look at the way they live and you look at the fruit of their life, it doesn't line up with what Scripture says. So we need to pursue that. I believe that in these last days that we are finding ourselves in, that there's a separation of the ten wheat. There's a separation of the sheep and the goats in the church. And I believe that God is calling His body to a place of purity and holiness in Him. Um, I believe that in these last days, the church, the real body of Christ, will crystallize out of that grouping referred to as Christians, and we will see the true followers of Christ who walk in the power and the might of the Spirit of God. Remember, still in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. And we need to see the power of God operating in the lives of true Christians, true believers. And we need to see them go out in their lives being a testimony of the goodness and mercy of God. Because we understand again that according to Revelation chapter 12, we, we Overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So we have to allow the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony to, to be preeminent in our lives, to be able to live the victorious life. Our lives need to speak Christ. When people come and they encounter you and me, they need to see Christ in us. And as our lives become relevant and shows the glory and the goodness and the mercy and the love of God, people will come to us and say, how do I get born again? How do I get what you have? And we will then have the opportunity to lead them to Christ. And they can then obviously pray the salvation prayer. That does not mean that we don't use every avenue, every opportunity, every situation, every moment of every day to pronounce and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. So yes, we use everything. We will use media. We will use social media. We'll use printed media. We'll use um, whatever. And the thing is that we will use every opportunity that the Holy Spirit gives us to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, it's got to come down to our hearts. We ultimately need to spread the gospel, spread the good news, and we need to make disciples 
of the people that come into the kingdom of God. Disciple is a follower of Christ. Christian is a small uh, Christ or is an anointed one. Christian is a small anointed one. So we need to be the anointed ones. Amen. So as we close this particular topic and this particular session, um, I want you to get ready for the next one. Um, and then I'm going to pray and we're going to close this off and I'm going to release you to prepare for the next one. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together. Lord, as we've gone through this topic, I pray that Lord, it's not, it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which sent out to do. I thank you that it's fallen on fertile ground. I thank you it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's cutting between thought and intent, bone and marrow. And Father God, I thank you right now that it is penetrating the lives of your people and getting them to come and live a life of holiness and purity and seeking to, to operate um, uh, after the heart of God and to do the things that you purpose and plan for us, Lord. So we give you all the glory, honor, and praise right now. And thank you for all the work that's been accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Get ready for the next session. Um, I think it's Connie that's on. She'll be with you shortly. Amen.